Hello, bonjour. My name is Pierre Ben Susan. I'm going to address you a guitar workshop today regarding um, beginners' intermediate levels. I'm going to introduce you to the tuning I've been using for a long, long time. It's called DADGAD, D A D G A D, from bass to treble strings. I'm going to tell you about its origins, how to tune the guitar in that tuning, how to stay in tune, if possible, to tune it without a tuner. Uh, I'm going also to um, talk about the principles of a good guitar posture, uh, good hand positions, uh, some techniques for both hands, how to build chords in that tuning, uh, some notions of harmony, modes and scales. Um, look at a piece slowly and gradually increase the speed. Um, the importance of applying the right fingering Look at the harmony of the piece, build some chords, and also um, the help of singing, how it could increase our inner ear. So I've been playing guitar in Dad since 1974. I found this tuning randomly as I was noodling around. Uh, and I realized some years later that other people had found it too because it's a very easy tuning to find. You know, I'm referring to people like David Graham from England, but also Jimmy Page, Ry Cooter, Johnny Mitchell. Um, my, my attitude with that guy was that I was, I'm self-taught. So in fact, I was playing different alternative tunings. I came from standard tuning and um, I was listening to a lot of blues from the Delta and all those guys were like myself self-taught and played in different tunings. So for me, tuning the guitar differently was something natural. So when I found that GAD, it opened a door that has never been closed. So that GAD, D-A-D-G-A-D, from bass to treble string, this is how it sounds. <laughs> D, A, D, G, A, D. So we have three Ds, two A's, and a G. So if now, just a, a short notion of harmony, if you consider that D will be the note that give its tonality to this tuning, D will be our first degree of a scale. And so if we look at a major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven degrees, and eight being the octave, a major scale with a third major, fourth, that's the G, fifth, sixth, seventh major, octave. So my G is a fourth degree on that scale of D, and so that tuning is called D suspended force, because in that tuning there is no third, which, as you know, the third gives a mode. And so the mode is referring to major mode, minor mode. There is no mode. This tuning is called modal because of the absence of mode, and because it is unresolved to a mode, the, the force, being the G, is not resolving itself to a, a D major or a D minor. So it's called suspended force. And I think this is what really attract, attracted me, is the fact that this tuning is definitely open. Not only it's an open tuning, but it's a tuning whose color is available to a lot of things, opposed to a tuning where you have, like for blues, for instance, you already tune your guitar into a major chord. I tried that too, but it's very, very connotated already. So I like the idea that it was to me to color the harmony of that tuning. Now I would like to speak to you about how to tune a guitar in that tuning. So if we are in standard tuning, we are going to detune three strings out of the six. The first bass going to from E to D. And the two treble strings are going to be tuned down one step also. So from B to A and from E to D. So we have now that gap. Now the thing is, 
how do we tune the guitar into that guide? How, do, how can we make sure that we are always in tune and to get used to the right pitch and not get used to play out of tune? And as soon as we are out of tune, to know that we are out of tune and correct that. So my thing is that the more in tune you play, the more your ear is going to, to hear the right pitch. Of course, we can use tuners. I do use tuners as well because it's, it's very accurate. But I think your ear is more accurate than any tuner if you know how to work your ear. And being a musician, you absolutely know how to work your ear. You need your ear to really listen as much as possible and relay on what you listen to. So let's try to tune this tuning, to, to tune the guitar in that guide and, and control that we're in pitch, all the six strings related to each other. The first thing you want is to, uh, to find a reference, which is going to be your A at 440 cycles. That's my A, 440 cycles. Based on that, I'm going to play in harmonic. You, you, you know how to play in harmonic? You put your finger on the fret, in the fifth fret, on the second bass string, which is the A bass. And, but you don't press that string, you just, you just let the finger, as soon as you pick um, the string with your right hand, like the index here, you, you, you just, you know, put your finger up like this. And so the fifth fret and the seventh fret on the D string, which is the third bass string, should give you the same note, the unison. And so you compare now those two sustains, those two uh, waves or resonances, and they should be parallel. Let's say you are not hearing a parallelism, but you are hearing a tremolo. I detune the guitar on purpose. So first you try to really get that unison and you listen carefully to the waves. Then you control by playing those two strings. A fifth, for instance, like A, E, da ba da da da, one, two, three, four, five. And now you tune the D the D string, third bass string, with the G string. Same thing, fifth fret on the D, seventh fret on the G. I'm pretty good. And now I'm going to, because I'm on the G, I'm going to stay on that seventh fret on the G and go to the twelfth fret on the first treble string, the D. And I should have the same note unison again. So 7th fret, 12th fret on the first treble string. I should have the first, I should have the same note. Now I'm going to tune the second treble string, the A, with the same A which was my reference point at the beginning, in the, in the 5th fret on the A, 12th fret on the A, 5th fret on the A bass, 2nd bass string, 12th fret on the 2nd treble string, which is also A. Okay, and now I'm going to tune the bass. I'm going to go to the D, third bass string, 12th fret, and I'm going to play that bass, the first bass string, on the fifth fret. I hear it slightly, slightly flat. Right, this is how you tune your guitar. Okay, so you want to, as a little exercise, to detune your guitar and to, to apply this concept, take a reference point, like a tuning fork, plug it with your A, 440 cycles, and tune your first, uh, second bass string to that reference point, and tune all the five other strings based to it. Now, one thing which is very important is how you hold your guitar, how do you what is the behavior of your hands, you see? Um, 
I used to play the guitar with the guitar on my right leg, like this, and to do this. After many years of playing like this, I started to have pains into my neck because my, my arm was so high here and I played a jambo guitar. My, my arm, my right arm was so high that I started to really have pain to my neck all the way down to my lower back. So gradually I knew I had something, I, I needed to do something about it. And I changed to the classical guitar position, which is to put my guitar on the, on the left leg and to, instead of using a foot rider, which is also something that sort of unbalance the pelvis and it could lead to pain, I have my two feet on the ground and I use this thing, which is called, it's a riser. The company doing this is neck up support based in the USA. And basically you can control the height of this and you put this on your leg and the guitar is at the right height. And now you hold it like this, and you're in the right position. Mm. The right arm, the right arm, the, the shoulder goes low, gradually, smoothly. And so you have all the fluid, all the blood going to your fingers. No tension, okay? And what you do is that you put your thumb on the first bass string, and you put your three other fingers index on the G string, middle finger on the A treble string, and ring finger on the D treble string, like this. That would be the sort of native position. Basically, the thumb addresses the three bass strings, and the other fingers address the three other strings. But sometimes the thumb plays only on the bass string, and you have all the fingers to play the bass strings. It's all depending on the context, and there are a lot of exceptions. Here, the the left hand, you, you see the thumb here, is basically here, underneath the fretboard, sort of in the middle, so that it stabilizes your left hand when you do your fingerings. And when you move your fingers, you want to sort of lift them up from the string so that you don't hear any string noise. Okay, you want to reduce the string noise as much mm -hmm. as possible, and so you you move your finger to the next position, like this, they lift up and they, they, they take off from one string, they land on another fret without staying in contact with that string, okay? Sometimes, of course, you slide, that's different. That's different. But you don't hear a finger noise, you hear the note. You see all those things, all those sound like this, you try to avoid them. Okay, so that's for the hand position. You want to uh, um, you breathe. You don't want to contract anything on your face, your, your mouth. You want to have everything really supple, no contraction, to breathe normally, and to be in listening mode, basically, to really pay attention to the sounds you are going to produce. Now let's, let's look a little bit at some technique, some hands behaviors, how to address, for instance, the six strings with your right hand. We are going to take a virtual uh, example of playing the six strings and blocking the neck, the fretboard, so that we hear only a percussive sound. Anywhere where it's percussive, let's try to not hit harmonics. We want the sound to be very short. We want to hear the attack. I'm going to, same thing, my um, thumb is going to stay rest on the first bass strings, my three fingers are going to rest on the three last strings, and I'm going to do an arpeggio with three fingers and at the beginning not address the thumb. It's only going to be the three fingers. And the fact to rest the thumb like this gives my hand a stabilization. In fact, my fingers are going to remember the space between them and the thumb. It's funny how it works, but it's amazing. It's really, really accurate. This is called the muscle memory, the space memory. There are many degrees for the memory to work. This is one of them. So in fact, so anywhere I block, okay? And now I'm going to do an arpeggio. On the four first strings. So the first string is gonna be hit by my ring finger the second string by my middle finger, 
the third string by my index, and the fourth string, which is the third bass string, by my middle finger again, not my thumb, my middle finger again. So. Ring, middle, index, middle, ring, middle, index, middle, slowly, ring, middle, index, middle, ring, middle, index, middle. So you can do that as slow as you need to do. You know that the slow speed is the best friend of the learner, as we say. By playing this, those, those four hits, I'm creating a measure of four, four. One, two, three, four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one. And when I do that, I'm going to help my body to feel that groove by having my feet to mark the first beat and the third beat. F third beat. One, two, three, four. So you don't see it, but my foot is marking the one and three. And in fact, I could share that one and three between my two feet. One, two, three. Right feet, left feet, right feet, etc. Okay? It's just to bring the rhythm inside of your body so that you can feel it. So this is a good speed, okay? It might feel slow to you, but we are going now to bring the thumb into the play, and we are going to have the thumb to play on the first beat, like this. See what my thumb does? My thumb goes back to rest on the bass after playing. You can choose that moment. It doesn't have to go and rest right away. It doesn't have to go and rest at all. You can have this bass to keep ringing, of course, in a normal context. You might want that note to keep ringing, but you might want to stop that note as well. So this is how you will do. At the same time, one finger plays, the thumb goes back to rest. So you do two things at once. Here, my thumb goes back to rest on the second beat. At the same time, my middle finger plays. It goes, it would go back to rest on the third beat. At the same time, my index plays on the fourth beat. At the same time, my middle finger plays. Right now, I'm choosing the second beat, okay? That's arbitrary. My son plays on the first beat. My, now my son is going to play on the second beat. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. Two, three. And my feet keep beating the one and three, yeah? Now my thumb is going to play on the third beat. Three, four. Three, four. On the fourth beat. And every time my thumb goes back to rest on the following beat. Second. If I play my thumb on the first beat, my thumb goes to rest on the second beat and so forth. Okay. A little bit faster now. Increase the speed only when you are comfortable. If you are not comfortable, play slowly. You want to validate this information. Sequences of four. On the second beat now. Third beat. Fourth beat. Everywhere, on every beat. And 
what I do in fact, I'm going to go back slowly, my fingers are already on the string before playing that string. You see, I anticipate their position. You want to be able to anticipate as often as you can, so that you are already on the right strings to address before creating the sound coming from that string. You see? No bass. Now let's play two bass strings. Let's play two consecutive bass strings on the one and two, on the two and three, on the three and four, on the one and three, on the two and four, on the one and four, on the one and two, on the two and three, three and four, one and four. On the one and three, back to the one and four. On the two and four. With the feet on the one and three, that's very interesting. You see, this is how you synchronize rhythm in your body whatever happens between with those, those rhythm and how you hand synchronize that, you need to feel at home with it. This is why you want to bring this information securely and slowly so that you feel right about it. Now let's look at a bit of technique for the left hand. Um, my, my left hand is a bit like a spider. It has to be gentle, strong, be able to be agile, flexible, but to be also very, very precise. And my left hand is creating the, 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 the quality of, of the history of the sound. In fact, my right hand initiates the sound. You know how they say in Spain, when they say to play the guitar, they say to touch the guitar, tocar la guitarra. So your right hand is in fact the key hand which is going to create the sound of the music you are going to, to hear. So in fact, your right hand is extremely important. The way you touch the guitar is going to determine the quality of the tone and the sound. But you perpetuate that first hit of your right hand by the work on the left hand, which is going to play vibrato and also effects. Ornaments, all that kind of thing, glissando, slice, pulling off hammers on. With the different vibratos you can use. You realize that I'm not looking at my left hand, I'm not looking at my fretboard. In fact, my ears are my eyes. It's okay if I make a mistake. I just want to feel the space between the fingers, the frets, and what I hear, so that my fingers remember those locations and what sounds in those locations. See? This is vibrato, which is like a perpendicular movement, like an electric guitar. You can increase the speed, you can be very slow, and it's still going to be very quite effective. You can play a classical vibrato, like if you were playing a nylon string, which is a parallel movement. realize also that I try to not make noise with my fingers when they move on the fretboard. I release when I, I when my fingers move, they in fact 
they take off from the fretboard and come back on the fretboard, land again, but they don't stay in contact. Why not? If you do a slide. I'm in that guard, I'm in D. Let's work on a D major scale, so that we're going to sort of obtain a good attitude with a, with a left hand. I'm going to pick the notes that my left hand is going to organize with my right hand, and I'm going to use two fingers in an alternative movement, so that I never repeat two consecutive notes with the same finger. Like if I start with my in middle, uh, sorry, with my index finger, the next finger is going to be the middle finger, and so forth. You've all heard the scale already. This is an organization of notes in a given mode. The Greek. I've called this mode Ionian, which is a major mode made of degrees and intervals. Between my D and my E, there is one full interval made of two half steps, one full step. Between my, my E, which is my second degree in the uh, scale of D, D being my first degree, one, two, my third degree, it's going to be my F sharp, and it's going to be a major third. And so the quality of the third gives the quality of the mode. Uh, if you want to have a major mode, the third is going to be major. If you want to play in a minor mode, the, the third is going to be minor. You've heard that. It's more melancholic, more nostalgic. The third is minor. Minor mode. Major mode. The fourth, only half step, one half step between the third major and the fourth. If I play a third minor and a fourth, then there will be a wall step. The fifth, the perfect fifth. In D, my fifth is an A. My sixth. To be my seventh major is going to be a C sharp major because my seventh natural will be here. That's the seventh minor, which has nothing to do with the quality of the mode of the third. The third gives the mode minor major, but the seventh minor on major has nothing to do with the quality of the third. So you could be in a in a minor mode, and still play a seventh measure. Yeah, interesting. Yeah? Or in a, in a major mode and play a seventh minor, which you will be called seventh, just, just all by itself, seventh, not seventh minor. That's the seventh. That's the seventh measure. So this is a D major seventh measure. And you will not say major. If you say D major seventh, it means you are in major. So you see, I'm in that guard, but I'm already addressing chords. You see, so the tuning has nothing to do with the fact that whatever the tuning, you can build chords. One, two, three, four, five, six, seventh minor, seventh major octave. So you see, if I stay between the f fret number one and fret number seven, I get that. I go slowly. I start with my index finger here. Now I'm going to start with my middle finger. position on my left hand, 
I don't want my fingers to go and move in order to be to the to the notes. They are already above the note where they are they are supposed to be. In fact, the left hand looks like a spider. And here, a little two fingers, same fret. But you could also play this with only one finger and a partial bar. See? The last knuckle does that. Or use two fingers. The principle of scales is that you, in fact, identify all the notes on your instrument from the lowest to the highest in D major. But I have also the A open here, so... Aha! Here I'm stuck. I want to go in that direction, but my hand, I'm at the... the end of my hand, so in fact I need to create a new hand. So what I'm going to do is called a keyboard. I go from my little finger to the next note with my index finger. And I create a lot of keyboards depending how... You have the same notes all over the fretboard. So in fact, depending where you are, it dictates a different fingering. And you have to sort of think about how to go from one string to another string, like if you are crossing on a little bridge and the string is a river. And you are crossing on that little bridge and Everywhere you have a different bridge depending from what string you come from, where which string you are going towards. See? Also, think of different bridges. The thing with that guy is that it has all those beautiful open strings and you feel like, you know, getting into it with open strings. But as an open string has a certain to tone color. It's very emphatic, in fact. An open string is going to allow you, during the time it is ringing, to, to give you time and space for your left hand to move to a next position. So sometimes it's very nice to use an open string. But on an open string, you cannot use a left hand vibrato because the string is open. What you can do is that you can move, you know, you, you can manipulate your guitar by, you know, pushing on the, on the neck, pulling on the neck, sort of move the, the, the body so that, you know, the, the molecules of sounds which are inside the box go out by waves. I pull on the neck and I'm playing a, D, a A open, second treble string. It's almost... What I do, you know, because I'm playing in a classical guitar position, if I pull on the guitar, when I do this effect, the guitar goes away from me. So what I do usually, I use a strap that I put a, around my back to go from there to there, around my back, so that 
The guitar stays always with me. I don't have my strap right now. I don't practice with my strap, but when I am in a performance, I use my strap because I manipulate my guitar a lot just to accompany the sounds of the music I play. I, I create those colors by using the left-hand vibrato, but also a combination of left-hand vibrato and guitar movement. Manipulation, so that a bit like an electric guitarist with a warmy bar, it's not as significant on a steel string, but it is quite, quite amazing. I'm using my two fing first fingers, index and middle finger, on the three first four bass strings, and then when I go down, I start using the ring finger. Now let's, let's use the lute technique some index, some index, some middle. As I'm going my way down, instead of the index, I use the middle. Some index, some index, some middle, some middle. So the idea of playing a scale is to go from the lower note on your instrument to the higher note of your instrument, so that you identify all the notes everywhere they are, okay? I stay in minor mode, okay? So third minor. Sixth minor, seventh minor, octave. What's happening here? I'm reaching the end of my hand. So I need to create a way so that I can go in that direction. So when I'm there, I choose a new hand. C, little finger, seventh fret, index. Same way to go down again. I'm attacking every string, but I could also do a little ornamentation, which is like, a, it's called a mordant, no, not, sorry, not a mordant, it's like a slur. The action of hammering on. One hit with my right hand, and several notes. I do not advise you to play that technique right away, but eventually, yes, this is a great technique also to approach. But now it's better to really understand the principle of attacking every note. I went all the way to the first treble string, staying in the fifth fret, and then from that first treble string, I made my way up to the seventh fret, eighth fret, etc. This is, I choose the bridge between, in fact, there, but now I'm going to choose a different bridge. I'm going to try to, to go to higher in the neck from my second bass strings. Here. You see, I'm, creating, I'm going to create a new hand. And now it dictates 
the same notes in different position, different location. And you see my, I'm barring because in fact it's addre I'm addressing a lot of notes all in that seventh fret, so I'm barring. Ornamentation is like a hammer on and a pulling off. Instead of doing that, I'm going The D is also on the 12th fret on the same bass string. Now I'm staying in the, between the 7th and the 12th fret. You see? Third bass strings. I'm going to go from the, uh, the third bass string to a new hand. You see my point. My point is that you need to play the scales, the same scales from the lowest note to the highest note everywhere on your fretboard and identify all those notes so that ultimately, eventually, you know where those notes are. Your fingers remember their location. Your fingers have been learning to get there, and your fingers know after a while, they remember their muscle memory, and they know how to behave to get there. In order for the fingers to understand and to validate this information, you need to do it very, very gradually, slowly, to really understand, to try to get the best tone possible with your right hand, and from there, you will increase the speed naturally without even noticing you do. When you play a scale, you want, to co you want to conclude the scale with a chord, the chord of the degree of the scale. That's a D minor, with no open strings, but I could also play the, the D open. Measure. The way to build chords in that guide is the same way to build chords in other tunings. You want to go to, you want to look for the one, three, five, remember, the, the triad, the minimum triad consisting of two intervals, and play those one, three, five everywhere on the fretboard. And then you want to go to a new, a new organization of intervals based on this one, three, five, and create a first inversion called you are going basically to switch the intervals. Instead of starting on the first degree, you are going to start on the third degree, and it's going to be three, five, one. And then the second inversion is going to be starting on the fifth degree, and you're going to be five, one, three. So one, three, five. And now three, one, five. And now five. One, three. Okay. In fact, now to build the chords, what I what I what I did to learn how to build chords in that guide was to split my six strings in a section of three strings. 
So the three first strings, then the, from the second, then from the third string, and then from the G, and find all the one, three, five in all those sequences of three strings to identify them. See, one, three, five. First inversion. Now, second inversion. See, I'm identifying the note. I'm not trying to play a chord with resonances, three strings resonate together. I'm identifying the notes. Sorry. Now. So I have identified all the one, three, five, three, five, one, five, one, three, on the three first strings. And you start, and you keep on doing that one string down now. You keep going down. This one, but That's one way to build the D major chord. Same thing with the minor chord. Minor third. Tell me, will I ever play that chord here? Probably not, but it's good to know it's here. I think you see my point. You really want to spend time looking around into this, and of course, you can you know, get a book about harmony to understand the concepts and to apply this very basic search for one, three, five, and then you can augment one, three, five, then get with the four, you can minorize the third to play a minor mode, a major mode, and then you can increase with more degrees. And, you know, this is how you're going to find the chords. I don't think you need to buy a book with all the chords there. You want to create the chords yourself. You want to find the chords on your own because they are there available to you. And this is so much fun. <laughs>